Hello transport nerds and welcome back to Talking Planning. Today's review is a hybrid format and I want to cover off on both a vehicle and some associated infrastructure. One of the best ways to help buses travel faster is to separate them from private vehicle traffic. After all, a bus is so much more space efficient than a private car. But when it's stuck in the same traffic jam as everyone else, it becomes a lot more difficult to convince people to leave that car at home to make a positive change. After all, I can see why if you're gonna be stuck in traffic anyway, you'd probably like to be stuck there with the temperature just right, with the heated or cooled seats on and enjoying your sound system. So transport agencies respond to this and separation of buses and private vehicle traffic is a key part of a network planner's toolkit. In its most basic form, you can start with something like a painted bus lane, but with more investment and higher uses, we can move up to dedicated separated corridors. If public transport is zooming past while cars are stuck in traffic, drivers start to get lane envy. But with the right product, messaging and marketing, you can actually channel that energy and convert some of that lane envy into public transport patronage. Importantly though, Land use also plays a key role in transport planning and mixed use development allows housing, services, retail and employment to be located closer to each other. Better land use decisions can help reduce the burden on our transport systems and that makes it easier for people to choose to walk, cycle or use public transport for a greater portion of their journeys. Australia has three dedicated bus separated corridors that I can think of off the top of my head. Adelaide has the O-Barn, which is a separate corridor that requires buses to be fitted with guide wheels to use. Brisbane has its busway network, which is a large dedicated corridor for buses. And it's busy enough that it manages to have significant queuing during peak periods. And last, we have the Transit Way, a New South Wales implementation, and I'll be showcasing a portion of it on board a T80 service on board today's quintessential T80 bus, a Volvo B7 RLE with a custom CB80 body. Jumping on board, you can tell that this bus was one of the first new vehicles for transit systems with the now normal TSA seat fabric. This bus was built in September 2013 and presumably just made it into the fleet in time for the commencement of operations in October. By now, you'll probably be familiar with the CB80 body style on this channel, and there doesn't seem to be any weird trickery with this one's layout. That being said, if you need a luggage rack for a suitcase or something, TSA's chosen layout isn't going to help you out. The flip-up seating area on this bus is huge, with seats for four people on each side, and legroom is also decent throughout, something I'm fairly sensitive to, being just over 1.8 metres tall. The seat padding is also pretty good, important for long distances between Parramatta and Liverpool. This makes the B7s fairly comfortable, although having the roof hatch open is often a sign that the aircon isn't holding up as well. B7 RLEs have been popular across most of the country, enjoying sales successes in Queensland, New South Wales, Western Australia and Victoria, with both government and private operators. Being a 2013 model, this one should be Euro 5 rated, and fitted with the Volvo D7E engine offering 290 horsepower, which is not bad, so let's have a quick listen now. Although a little quieter on today's trip, a Sunday morning, 
the TAD service can get pretty busy, and during the week you'll find double-decker and articulated buses also running on the service, including Bustech CDIs, Volvo B12 BLEAs, and their latest acquisition, some Volvo B8L double-deckers with Gemmerlang bodies. What surprises me most about the T-Way is the open nature of its road corridor. Sure, it's signposted, but there aren't barriers down most of the length like Brisbane's busway has. At least the vegetation is a nice sight and there's a decent amount of the corridor accessible by adjacent shared pathways. The corridor does travel quite close to residential housing, however, at grade, so it'll be interesting to see how that impacts noise. I suspect the intentions of the T-Way were rather different to those of the O'Barnum Busway, as Sydney's rail network is a fair bit more comprehensive and the T-Way provides more of a cross-corridor link rather than a high-frequency trunk network. Jumping off at Finlayson, the B7 saturation is real and especially on a weekend, there are plenty of them along the corridor to watch for. And a pair of them make their way towards Parramatta. Finlayson has a plain and simple layout with two large metal and glass shelters, tactile paving and information signage, and at grade pedestrian crossings to get from one side to the other. The T-Way is certainly a step up from being stuck in traffic and painted lanes on a regular road, filling in a gap between the next priority levels for infrastructure, light rail or heavy rail service. So thanks for joining me and I will see you again soon.